Okay, you ready? Do you want to do the sign on this time, like the introduction? Sure. Oh, I get <laughs> okay, hold on. Okay, so today we're going to start chapter five. So section 5.1 is going to be all about um, probability distributions. So let's just review a couple definitions that we've already seen before, and now we're going to apply them in this section. So a variable is a characteristic or attribute that can assume different values. And a random variable is a variable whose values are determined by chance. So if you guys remember back to chapter one, we defined two different types of variables. So the first one was discrete variables, and those are things that have a finite number of possible values um, or an infinite number of values that can be counted, where counted means like using the numbers one, two, three, and so on. And then the other type of variables um, were continuous variables, and those can assume all values in an interval between any two given values. And those are usually obtained from data that can be measured. So in chapter five, we're gonna strictly focus on discrete variables. And then when we get to chapter six, we'll focus on the continuous ones. So today we're gonna look at a discrete probability distribution, which is just um, basically like a table that's gonna lay out for us um, all of the different probabilities that go with a certain um, situation. So let's just do an example. And I think once we do one, um, you'll see how easy this is. So example one says to construct a probability distribution of tossing three coins where X is the random variable for the number of heads. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is um, figure out what your sample space is. So remember your sample space is all of your possible outcomes. So we're tossing three coins and we know that for each coin, um, we can you know, either get a heads or a tails as the result. So what are all the possibilities? Well, we could get three tails. Um, we could get tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails. Um, Heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, and then three heads. Okay, so I think I got all of them there. Okay, so that's our sample space. Now the probability distribution, we're just gonna kind of organize our information here. So what you wanna do is kind of just like label whatever your random variable is. So for that, it's gonna be the number of heads. So we'll put number of heads X to just indicate that that's our um, variable. And then below that, we're gonna put all of the probabilities. So we'll have probability and P of X as our notation there. Okay, so the number of heads. So what are the possibilities? Well, we could have zero heads, one head, two heads, or three heads. Okay, so let's figure out the probability of getting each of those. So Dr. Inso, I'll ask you, what would the probability of getting zero heads be? So that would be, um, you'd have to get tails, tails, tails. So there's one possibility of that happening and there's eight total outcomes. So it's one eighth. Perfect. So there's one outcome there out of the entire um, sample space that has zero heads. So one out of eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then let's see for number of heads being one, we can see that there were three outcomes in the sample space that only had one head. So that would be three out of eight. And then um, for two heads, we see that there were also three outcomes out of the total eight that had that. And then three heads, there's obviously just one way that can happen out of the eight. So that has a probability of one eighth. Okay, so that's your probability distribution. It's just figuring out what all the probabilities are um, for your random variable. And then B says that we wanna represent graphically the probability distribution from part A. So the way we do that is just with a histogram. So we're just gonna kind of draw that for ourselves. So we'll put number of heads on our x-axis, probability on the y-axis. Um, and then let's see, we wanna just put um, the zero, one, two, three on the x-axis. And then it's kind of up to you. I mean, if you're doing this by hand, it's definitely up to you how you wanna label your y-axis. I believe on connect, they're gonna kind of set that out for you so you won't have to determine that. But I went by um, ACE on here. 
So let's see, um, around the zero, we want to do a height of one eighth. And then around the one, we'll go up to three eighths. Around the two, we'll go up to three eighths. And around the three, we'll go up to one eighth. And that's it, that's your um, histogram that goes along with that probability distribution. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to say that with these discrete probability distributions, we're going to be, you know, you can write out all the possibilities, but that's why we went into the combinatorics last time, calculating permutations and combinations, because this help us, helps us calculate the number of possibilities and then like the number of ways to get one head or two heads. Those are counting problems. And so that's why we spent all of chapter four on counting problems. Okay, so then in example two, it says that the data shown consist of 40 World Series events. So it's like looking at the last 40 World Series. Um, and it says the number of games played in each series is represented by the variable x. Find the probability of each x and construct a probability distribution and draw a graph. Okay, so, look, so we put down here that um, the number of games is our random variable. And then the probability um, is that the, the we're going to have four games, five games, six games, or seven games is what we're going to lay out on our table. So of course, the World Series has to have at least four games because you have to win four out of the seven games to, uh, to win a World Series. And so in the last 40 years, um, it looks like eight World Series were ended in four games. So that would be a clean sweep. Um, and then seven uh, were, were five games long. So if you want to calculate the probability for four games, you need to take eight divided by the total number of World Series that we're counting, which is 40. So that gives you a probability of 0.2. So there's a 0.2 or a 20% chance that a World Series would end in just four games. And then similarly for five games, you need to take seven over 40 and get 0.175 for the probability. Um, there's a nine out of 40 or 0.225 um, probability that the game, that it'll last six games. And then it looks like the majority, or at least the most probable outcome is that the game, that the series is gonna last seven games. That's 16 out of 40 for the last, Sorry, Gemma's rambunctious. Um, that's a that's a 0 0.4 percent or 0 0.4 40 percent chance that the, the World Series is going to last seven games. Um, and so then you can plot this on the probability distribution chart or histogram chart. And so we have four, five, six, and seven. And again, we're going to put 0 0.2 around the four, and then 0 0.175 around five, and then 0.225 around six, and then 0.4 around seven. And so we see here that it's more likely that the games are going to last, series is going to last six or seven games than it is going to be four or five games for sure. Yeah, and students um, usually ask me why did we have to use decimals in this one? Like why couldn't we just use fractions? And the answer is that I just did what the textbook did. So um, there's no specific reason why we use fractions on the last one and decimals on this one. Okay. It's honestly your choice. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do either one. Obviously, I can connect math. You just need to pay attention to do whatever form they want you to use. Right. And it's also important to note that the probabilities add up to one here. Um, they will always add up to one. Okay. And I guess that's what we're, the next slide is going to say. Two requirements for probability distributions. The sum of yeah. probabilities of all events in the sample space must equal one. So that's the sum of the P of X's is one. The probability of each event in the sample space must be between zero and one. For any event, it's got to be between zero and one. Um, do you want to look at example three? Yeah, so um, let's just use those two requirements to look at these three examples here and just determine whether or not um, they represent a probability distribution. So just two things you have to check. Each individual probability needs to be a number between zero and one, and then the sum of the probabilities needs to add up to one. As long as you have those two things, then it's a probability distribution. So let's see, for the first one, um, each individual probability value is between zero and one. And let's see, if we add 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3, what does that add up to? 1.2? 1.2, yeah. I just know it's not one for sure. So um, that answer would be no, that is not a probability distribution because the sum of the px's does not add up to one. 
Oh, you gave away the answer for the Sorry, second I was, one. I was trying to move our, our heads away from the from the box and I guess it clicked on the PowerPoint instead. Okay, so we got a little preview there. So the second one, um, let's see, one fourth, one eighth, three eighths, one eighth, and one eighth, all of those um, are numbers between zero and one, so that's good. And then if you add up all of those five fractions, it does come out to be exactly one. So yes, that is a probability distribution. And then um, let's see, can you spot what is wrong with the third one? We have negative numbers. Yeah, you have a negative 0.5 as the probability that goes with four. And remember, there's no such thing as having a negative probability. So that's just silliness and that is not a probability distribution. And you'll notice though that it, they do add up to one. So if you're just checking whether it adds up to one, you know, that's not enough. You no. do have to check both requirements. I mean, the 0. 0.6 and the 0. 0.4 add up to one, but the negative 0. 0.5 makes it. Oh, yeah, yeah you're right. That one's only in two cents. No, good. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, our heads are blocking this. So I'm gonna downsize this for a second. Okay. So section 5.2 is a mean, variance, standard deviation, and expectation. This section is really important if you want to go into actuarial science or work in the insurance industry or if you want to do financial trading. So um, pay close attention if you care about any of those sorts of things. So the formula for the mean of a probability distribution is um, it's pretty similar to what we did with uh, what we were doing before when we were taking weighted averages, Karen, a couple sections ago. Uh, weighted really averages. Yeah, we just called them weighted averages. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what this is, is a weighted average, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to take, um, you're going to take your variables x1 through xn and their probabilities, px1, px2, px3, px4, up to pxn. And then the mean is just the weighted average. So it's x1 times px1 plus x2 times px2 and so on, which we abbreviate with this, just the summation formula, sum x times p of x. Okay. Um, so it's again, it's just taking the probabilities times the discrete probability distributions, the random variables um, times their probabilities. And then what are we saying here with the rounding rule, Karen? Um, so for uh, mean variance and standard deviation, you want to round to one more decimal place than whatever your um, outcome is in. Okay. Okay, so example four says find the mean of the number of spots that appear when a die is tossed. So we're just rolling a die. And so X is the number of spots that are showing when you roll it. And then the probability is P of X. And so we got to think about like, well, there are six sides to a die. So I should label that one, two, three, four, five, and six. And of course, each, each uh, side has a number of dots on it. And then each one of these is equally likely. We have a one sixth chance of rolling a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six, or a one. And so then the mu is going to be just the summation of those things. So it's going to be one times one six plus two times one six plus three times one six, and so on. And so when we add all that up, you get um, 21 over six or 3.5. Okay. So Karen, let me, let me just make, a, make an offer to you. Let's play a game where we roll a die, and I will give you, um, I will give you as many dollars as as there are dots showing on the die when we roll it. Okay, but um, it costs you four dollars to play this game. Would you play it? No. No. Because why not? it seems that the average number of um, dots that are going to show up is 3.5, so you'd be giving me $3.50, right, on average? Right, but I'm so, charging like $4. But if you're charging me $4, then I'm losing $0.50. Cents. On average, right. On average. So what if I were to offer you this game, but I, don't, but I would only charge you $3? Then I would probably play the game. Sure. Because if we played it a, a million times, you would make 50 cents a million times and you'd have $500,000. So this is what I mean by it's important to understand this section if you want to go into the financial industry because a lot of games in the insurance industry are just based on calculating these average values or these expected values and then looking at costs and seeing if it's worth it or not to take that bet. Okay, can you tell us about variance and standard deviation? Yeah, so with probability distributions, we can also calculate um, the variance and standard deviation, and you can see those formulas there. So 
Let's do an example and we'll kind of go step by step through the formulas. So it says a box contains five balls, two are numbered three, one is numbered four, two are numbered five. Um, the balls are mixed, one is selected at random. After a ball is selected, its number is recorded, then it's replaced. If the experiment is repeated many times, find the variance and the standard deviation of the number on the balls. Okay, so first thing we need to do is just set up our probability distribution table. So um, the variable X is the, the number on the ball. Okay, so what are the options that we have? Well, um, it says that they're numbered three, four, or five. So those are all of our possibilities for the number that can show up. And then let's figure out the probability of each of those. So two are numbered three and it's out of a total of five balls. So that would be um, a probability of two fifths. One is numbered four, so that would be one fifth and two are numbered five. So that would be a two fifths probability. Okay, so that's our probability distribution. So before we can do the variance, um, we need to figure out what the mean is because you'll notice that in the formula for the variance, we need to subtract the mean squared. Okay, so let's figure out the mean first. So that's gonna be doing exactly what we just did in the previous example, where you take each um, value and multiply it by its corresponding probability and then add all those up. So we'll have three times two fifths plus four times one fifth plus five times two fifths. Type that into your calculator and you get four. Okay, that worked out nicely. All right, so the mean is four. Okay, now we're ready to plug stuff into the variance formula. Now the variance formula, it's really similar to the mean. Um, you're still kind of multiplying each X by its probability and then adding them up, only now it's gonna be X squared. So instead of just doing like three times two fifths, we're gonna do three squared times two fifths plus four squared times one fifth plus five squared times two fifths. And then we want to subtract the mean squared. So we're going to minus four squared at the end there. Mm -hmm. And then I would definitely use a calculator to figure out what that is. And that comes out to be four fifths, 4.8, if you would prefer that. Okay, so that's going to be the variance. Now to go from the variance to the standard deviation, you just need to take the square root. So we're gonna do the square root of um, either four fifths or 0.8. Either way, um, that comes out to approximately 0.9 when you do it to one decimal place. Okay, so that's how you do all of that out by hand. Now you can do this in your calculator. Um, what you wanna do is put, after you make your probability distribution, put your X values into L1 and then your probabilities into L2. And then all you have to do is go to one variable stats. And um, on the 83s, you're gonna then type L1 comma L2. On the 84s, you're gonna make L1 your main list and L2 your frequency list. And then your calculator is gonna give you two of these answers. So it's gonna give you the mean, only it's gonna label it as X bar. Okay, but it's the same thing. So whatever it says for X bar, that's gonna be your answer for the mean. And then it's gonna give you sigma, which is the standard deviation. Okay, so then you'll have the standard deviation and then to get the variance, you're just gonna take that value from the standard deviation and square that and that'll give you the variance. And remember, if you wanna square the exact value, that's where you do um, second bars, go down to stats, and go get the sigma value and then square that and that'll give you an exact answer. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do all of that by hand. We just kind of wanted to show you it once, but it's probably a better idea to just use your calculator on the um, longer problems on Connect Math. Hey Sam. Mm -hmm. And I, I just was gonna say that the variance being um, four fifths, you can, that kind of tells you like, okay, the mean is four, Right, so the average, the average value is four. When we look at this table, I mean, it's a very small table, so you can already see that it's actually more likely that you get a three or a five, even though the average value is four. So that standard deviation being um, being 0.9 shows you that you're 
very likely to have a standard deviation of close to one. Like you're, you're very likely to have different values than four. Whereas you could have a different distribution where you could have like four fifths times four and then um, one fifth for three and one fifth for five and you would get the exact same mean, but the data would be centered much closer to four. I don't know, just doing a little review. Okay, and so now we're gonna talk about expectation. So the formula for the expected value is the same for the formula for this theoretical mean. So expected value is the same kind of thing as like the average um, or theoretical mean. So it's that, it was just that weighted sum for the distribution again. And so this is, again, I've been hinting at, like if you're playing games or you're playing games of chance, this is the expected value. It's what you would get if you played the game many, many times. This is what you could expect to make in the long run. So it says 1,000 tickets are sold at $1 each for a color television, and the color television is, is valued at $350. What is the expected value of the gain if you purchase one ticket? Okay, so this is like, this is how like things like, um, uh, what's the, what's the website where you, is it like doordash.com or something? Or, you know what I'm talking about? They have these websites where you can like bid on things and you bid, it, the bid goes up by a dollar every time. And so like they advertise like, I got this color television for 20 bucks, but a thousand people bet on it. So that's the same sort of game. And we'll see how this works. So let's look at this. You either win the TV or you lose. So if you win the TV, you pay, you, you've got a gain of $350, but you paid a dollar. So you, you got a gain of $349. If you lose, if you buy a losing ticket, then you just lose a dollar. And then when we look at the um, probabilities here, you have a one in a thousand chance of winning the TV, and you have a 999 out of a thousand chance of losing a dollar. So your expected value then is 349 times one over a thousand plus um, minus one times 99 over, 999 over a thousand. So your expected value there is minus 0.65. So if you are silly enough to bet, bid that $1 on this $350 TV, in the long run, you expect to lose 65 cents every time you play this game. Of course, if you could buy all, well, even if you could buy all 1,000 tickets, you would lose um, a lot of money. You'd lose 65 cents on each bet. So I guess you would pay $650 for a $350 TV. So the conclusion is the person would lose, on average, 65 cents for each ticket purchased. And how do you know that signals that they lose money? Because the expected value is negative, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the sort of thing where if you see an expect, a negative expected value, you should not play the game. And then um, why is it 349? I mean, if we win the TV and it's valued at 350, why wouldn't our gain be 350? Oh, uh, because we had to pay a dollar for the ticket. So we, it was 350 minus one. So you, you're putting that into your calculation already, right? So you can either do expected, expected win of, of 350 and then minus one, and then I guess the other one would be expected gain of zero, but you minus one for the price of the ticket. Um, anything else I should say about this? No. Okay. Uh, do you want to take example seven? Sure. So it says that a financial advisor suggests that his client select one of two types of bonds in which to invest $5,000. Bond X pays a return of 4% and has a default rate of 2%. Bond Y has a return of 2.5% and a default rate of 1%. Find the expected rate of return and decide which bond is the better investment. And then when a bond defaults, um, that means that the investor loses all of the investment. Okay, so we're gonna wanna set up two tables here, one for bond X and one for bond Y and we're looking at the expected rate of return. So that's gonna be our variable X, and then we'll figure out the corresponding probabilities. So what are our possible options that can happen? Well, either the bond doesn't default or it does default. Okay, so let's look at what happens for each of these. So if it doesn't default, that means you're gonna get the return of 4% on your investment. Okay, so it's a 4% return. So we want to figure out what 4% of 5,000 is. So we'll multiply 0.04 times 5,000, and that comes out to be 200. Now, how often does that happen? Well, if it defaults 
2% of the time, then it doesn't default 98% of the time. So your probab probability there would be 0.98. Now, if the bond does default, that means you lose all of your investment. So you're out that $5,000. So that's gonna have a return of negative 5,000. And that happens 2% of the time. So the probability is 0 0.02. And then we'll just do the same thing for bond Y. So again, our options are that it doesn't default or it does. Mm -hmm. So let's see, this one has a return of 2.5%. So if it doesn't default, then we're going to get 2.5% um, of 5,000. So we'll do 0 0.025 times 5,000 is 125. And let's see, this one only has a default rate of 1%. So then it doesn't default 99% of the time. So that's 0.99. And then if it does default, you know, we're still going to be out our original investment of $5,000. So that's negative 5,000. And that happens 1% of the time, so the probability is 0 0.01. So we'll figure out the expected value um, for each one of these bonds. So we'll do 200 times 0.98. And then you can either do like plus negative 5,000, or I just normally would write that as minus 5,000 um, times the 0.02. Mm -hmm. Either way, that'll come out to $96 for bond X. And then for bond Y, um, we'll do the 125 times 0 0.99 plus negative 5,000 times 0 0.01. And that comes out to be $73.75. So which one looks like the better investment? Well, obviously the one that has the higher positive amount. So bond X would be a better investment since the expected rate of return is higher. Right. Cool. <clears throat> Okay, so um, now we're gonna do some extra practice problems. Um, so it looks like uh, 5.1, it says the probability that a phone company kiosk sells X number of new phone contracts per day is shown. Find the following. Okay, so looks like they're gonna sell, it's, X is the number of phones and it looks like they sell between four and 10. Um, so there's a 40% chance that they will sell four, a 30% chance they'll sell five, 1% chance or 10% chance they'll sell six, 15% chance they'll sell eight, and 0.05% chance that they'll sell 10. Apparently they never sell nine. Um, hopefully that adds up to, um, to one. I guess we should check that. Um, but you could do this by plugging this into your calculator and you would put in X as your L1 and P of X, the probability is to be L2 and hit one bare stats. Um, and it should just give you these values. You get mu is 5.4. So the average yeah. number of phones sold is 5.4. And just remember that'll, in your calculator, it's X bar, but that's the same thing for this application as mu. Yeah. And so then you get a variation of um, 2.9. Again, vari variation or variance is, is sigma squared. And then you get a standard deviation of 1.7, which is roughly the square root of 2.9. Well, let me quiz you, Dr. Insko. So when you're doing it in your calculator, which mm -hmm. value do you get first? Do you get the variance or the standard deviation? I think you said that in your calculator, you get the standard deviation first, and then you need to square that. Yeah. So, so you if you're... use the saved number and not the rounded number. Yeah, exactly. So don't get thrown off that, like, on Connect Math, like, it might ask you for the variance sure. first. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of ignore that, figure out the standard deviation from your calculator first, and then square that value to get the variance. Um, can you do D? So you have probability of six or more per day? Yeah, so what's the probability of sell six or more contracts um, three days in a row? Okay, so the first thing you want to figure out is what's the probability that they're just going to sell six or more um, for one day, basically. So that would be the outcomes of six, eight, or 10. So those are all the numbers that are six or more. So we'll add up those probabilities of 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and then 0 0.05. So that gives us um, a total probability of 0.3. Now they didn't just ask us about one day, they asked us about three days. So now we'll figure out the probability um, that that happens for three days. So basically each day 
we have a probability of that happening of um, 0.3. So we'll do 0.3 times 0.3 times 0.3 or 0.3 to the third power. So we end up with a final answer of 0 0.027 or about 2.7%. So I guess that kind of tells you that like if you were the owner of this kiosk and you were employing somebody and they um, and they sold three or more or six or more for three days in a row, then um, if they did that four days in a row, that'd be very highly unlikely, right? For three days in a row, it's like a 2.7% chance. Um, and if it's higher than that, then it's very, very, very unlikely. So either the person's very skilled at what they're doing or maybe they are cooking the books or something. So this yeah. is something where like um, in the financial industry, regulators often look for things like that. And they say, that's very improbable that these people at Wells Fargo are making these sales day in and day out. And so then they go back and they, that's when they like trip the switch and want to do an audit because they see like they're, they're, they're consistently achieving results that have like a 1% chance of occurring. And more often than not, that's not really due to chance. So, I don't know. Sorry. Another tandem. Um, I'll do this one. So it says the lottery offers um, $1,000 prize, one $500, and five $100 prizes. 1,000 tickets are sold at $3 each. Find the expectation if a person buys one ticket. Okay, so in that first example we did um, back in the notes with the TV, your only options were that you either won the TV or you didn't win the TV. Well, certain situations, you know, there might be more um, possibilities for what can happen. So you do want to take into account all of them. So with this situation, with this lottery, you know, we could win the $1,000 prize. We could win the $500 prize. We could win the $100 prize. Or we could win nothing. So we lose. Okay, so we do still want to figure out um, the gain and the probability for each one of those situations. So let's see, um, what's the gain going to be if we win a thousand? Well, just because we won a thousand dollars doesn't mean that's what our overall gain is because we do have to take into account that we bought a ticket that cost us three dollars. So mm -hmm. overall, our gain will be nine hundred and ninety seven dollars. Okay, And then likewise for the other amount. So if we win five hundred. Really, our overall gain is four ninety seven. If we win a hundred we really gained 97 and then if we lose well we're out that three dollars that we spent on the ticket so that would be a gain of negative three okay so the probability for each of these so there is one one thousand dollar prize out of a total of one thousand tickets so the probability is going to be one out of one thousand so that's the chance that we'll win that prize Okay, there's one um, ticket that corresponds to the $500 prize. So that's going to be one out of the thousand total tickets as well. But then there are five $100 prizes. So that means that five of those tickets out of the total thousand um, will be linked to winning the $100 prize. So that's five out of the thousand. Um, so Dr. Insko, can you figure out how we got 993 out of 1,000 for the probability that we'll lose? Yeah, so the, the winning tickets, there are only seven of those. So the other 993 out of 1,000 are losing tickets. So that was yep. just 1,000 minus seven. Yep, perfect. Okay, so now we'll figure out the expectation. So we'll do 997 times one over 1,000 plus 497 times one over a thousand, plus 97 times five over a thousand, plus negative three times 993 over a thousand. And you know, you can do this in your calculator. You can put your gain in L1, your probabilities in L2, and just do one bar stats, L1, L2. Um, and the mean is the same thing as the expected value. Um, but either way, you should get negative one as the expected value. So what does that mean? Well, that means that on average, a person can expect to lose $1 on each ticket purchase. Now on some questions on Connect Math, it'll just like, like the main question will be, um, find the expectation if a person buys two tickets. Okay, so if it's more than one ticket, it's not gonna change the process for the question at all until the very end. 
Okay, so if this is the expected value on average for one ticket, then for two tickets, all we have to do is multiply that by two. So the expected value uh, if a person buys two tickets would be negative two dollars. Yeah, the fancy word for that is expectation is linear, right? Is what? They say expectation is linear, which means you can just multiply by the number of times you play. Um, so I think that's it for this section. I, I had this funny tangent. I don't know if you want, want me to go into it, but um, there's actually been instances where people have done this calculation and realized that it was a good deal to play the lottery. Um, and so there was a group of mathematicians at MIT, I think it was like a stats class, where they said, well, let's calculate the, they, as, as, as a project, they're like, calculate the expected value of playing different lotteries. And they had a, a particular lottery in Massachusetts where if the jackpot hadn't been reached, then they reallocated the prizes. So instead of just having like one winning $1,000 ticket and one $500 ticket and then five $100 tickets, if the jackpot hadn't been hit for a number of times, they rolled some of the money back in as opposed to just keeping it from the previous lottery. And so then they would update it and it would be like, there'd be one winning $1,000 ticket, but then there'd be three or four $500 tickets and like 10 $100 tickets. And what the mathematicians figured out is that if the lottery hadn't been hit, the jackpot hadn't been hit in like five or six cycles in a row, it actually, the expected value became positive. And so yeah. if they bet, you know, if they bought like a thousand tickets, they could expect to make a dollar off a ticket or whatever. It was more than that, but they ended up like, well, first off, they went to the state and they asked the politicians, they said, this, we figured out that this is a positive for us. Is this illegal? And they said, no, because the money's just going to the schools anyway. So if you want to buy more tickets, go ahead. And so then they got investors and they actually bought, they went to like convenience stores and bought thousands of these tickets to make sure that they had a, a high probability of winning with that expected value. And they ended up making a ton of money off of it. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, if when you look at like that? massive, two, that was like I don't know, ten years ago maybe. If you look up, if you, I'll Google it and I'll, I'll post a link to the article on it. I mean, the the state has since um, stopped that particular lottery, but I mean, I think it went on for quite a while, and it's actually happened a couple of different places around around the the U.S. where they've had like state lottos where they, if the rules worked out just right, the expected value could be positive. I would think for most like gambling situations in, con in casinos, I would think most of the expected values are negative. Yeah, like all of them. People. Yeah. I mean, there are examples of like playing blackjack if they don't have enough decks where the cards can get hot and the probability is working in your favor. And then when they talk about counting cards, they basically, you, you create a system where you just count the number of face cards you see and you either go up or down and you kind of just hold it in your pocket and say, you, like I've seen people give talks on that. It's like if you if if the numbers if you're like keeping track of just certain cards showing up, and if you get like plus ten in your counting system, then you know that you should start betting more money. Um, but there again, you have to have a, you have to be in a place where there aren't that many decks, and I think it's really hard. Yeah. I had a student a few years ago who said he counted cards for a year, and. Um, he ended up making like 10 bucks an hour on average because he didn't have enough money when the cards got hot. He couldn't bet a million dollars like he needed to. He could only bet like a couple thousand dollars. And so even when the cards were hot and it was in his favor, he couldn't bet enough to make it like really worth his time. Hmm. So yeah, that's two different tangents. Yep. We'll probably trim that somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Yep. Uh, Alt 